All right, here we go, everyone. Another awesome episode of the All Around Adventure podcast. I'm excited to welcome back Patrick Sweeney to the podcast. Patrick, thanks so much for taking time for joining me today, and welcome back for round two. Josh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks, everyone, for taking time out of your busy day to tune in and uh, listen to us. Yeah, I've been uh, looking forward to talking with you again. However, I was really hoping that we could have done round two in person um, in, in the 2020 Spartan Media Fest. But as we all know, 2020 was a bit of a year and circumstances just weren't in our favor to meet up uh, that year. But hopefully, if we meet up for round three, it would actually be at an event like that again. I hope so. And I think uh, it's looking good. I just talked to Joe DeSena uh, last week, CEO of Spartan, and uh, they've kicked off races and they've got a bunch more planned. So they're excited to have a, a comeback year, hopefully. Yeah. And um, fingers crossed for that. And I do need to get myself signed up for some more Spartan events. You know, I was actually hoping to go for my trifecta in 2020. But then like, as I was looking at like race dates, yeah, just maybe like a day or two later, that's when uh, Spartan released the announcement that they've had to, you know, seize all races for the remainder of the year. So I'm like, "Mm." so so maybe 2021, I think will be my year to do that. (laughs) I hope so. All right. Well, um, now you have been coined as uh, the fear guru and fear is something that you talk about um, quite extensively. You speak with a lot of um, corporate leaders about this topic. You've written a book about it. Fear is fuel. And, um, you know, it's just it's something you've studied uh, quite in depth. But I want to go back in time a little bit and ask you, and this is certainly going to be for anyone who might be listening to us for the first time, is, um, you know, what actually kind of led you to study fear quite to the depth that you have been? Well, Josh, for me, it was a dramatic change in my life. So I grew up uh, as a son of first generation Irish immigrants in, in Boston and uh, and I had really low self esteem. I, I had a grandfather who was very abusive. He used to you know take off his leather belt, put us over his knee, and whip us with his belt uh, to to try and make us a man. You know, and and so um, uh, I had a pretty rough childhood, and we moved around a lot. And I was always trying to trying to build up my self confidence and self esteem, and try to get myself to be liked or at least respected. And um, and and really. Uh, because I was afraid all the time, I had all this shame of being afraid and, and being, you know, afraid of being bullied, being afraid of being rejected, being afraid of failing, all the, all the things that are, you know, kind of typical from uh, a lot of people in, in kind of a blue collar, you know, meager upbringings. And so consequently, my whole life, and then I saw a plane crash when I was six years old. So that really put a, planted a seed of terror in me. And I was always trying to do stuff to, to pretend that I wasn't afraid. I was always trying to build up this armor and this, this shield. And it was everything from uh, training for the Olympics. I was second in the Olympic trials and uh, raced the World Cup for three years and, you know, tried to become this great athlete. And then it was making a lot of money. I had a single goal of making $40 million by the time I was 40 years old. So 40 by 40 was my mantra and fuck everything else. I'm just going <laughs> to go, go for that and never mind friend family. And so I had this really toxic lifestyle because of it. And one day, and I had started uh, my second company, did my first venture back company, which was the first cloud-based company out there. Started my second one in this field of RFID, radio frequency identification. The company just took off. And uh, and I woke up one morning going to the gym and I felt this shooting pain in my arm and, and thought, well, I must have pulled a muscle or pulled a tendon. And and the next day I woke up and my arm was red and angry and it looked like a, you know, uh, it looked like it was on fire and oh, uh, like a hot stove. And I, I should have gone to the doctor then, but I didn't because I was afraid, right? I was terrified of what he's going to tell me. I was afraid to see doctors, afraid, you know, and, and so just having this defaulting to fear all the time, that's all I was doing. Whenever it came to a decision, you, you always have two ways of going when you have a decision, either fear or opportunity. And I always took fear. I always uh, did the, you know, fight or flight. And so third day rolls around. I couldn't even get out of bed. Uh, my arm had, it started to get red, all, you know, up higher on my arm. End up going to my local um, medicine, my local uh, hospital at the time. And the general practitioner was uh, 
you know, pretty knowledgeable guy in Reston, Virginia. And he said, we just did a blood test. You've got no white blood cells. We don't know what's going on, but we're going to send you to Johns Hopkins. Uh, and hopefully they'll figure it out. Hopkins ran a battery of tests. And uh, my one-year-old daughter went to her grandparents' house. My wife and I went up to Hopkins and and the doctor comes in and uh, he said, look, we don't know what it is, uh, what kind of leukemia you have, but uh, your, your T cells have gone rogue and they're attacking all your white blood cells. You've got no immunity, uh, immune system left. Oh, and man. this infection is going throughout your body, eating away at you. You should probably get your affairs in order and say your goodbyes. Mm. And uh, my wife was six months pregnant at the time. Uh, our one-year-old daughter was at home. And I thought, holy shit. Uh, I'm dying. And I, I thought, you know, this is it. This is the end of my life. I'm 35 years old. And uh, I have so much regret about all the things that I missed out on. And now it's over. I missed all the chance. So I had this, I had this incredible feeling of, of regret and loss. And I, I just felt like I was cheated. You know, like my life at 35 and it is already over. And they did a bunch of operations on me. Um, I, I ended up, you know, I had more tubes and wires stuck in me than the space shuttle. And I started using some of the things I learned at the Olympic Training Center, which I talk about um, in my book. And, and the new audio book actually has the psychologist, the sports psychologist from the Olympic Training Center talking about it, which is really fun. And, um, uh, you know, by the grace of God and those good doctors, I ended up beating leukemia, getting out of the uh, hospital. And when I got out, I said my biggest fear was flying. All I could think about was my one-year-old daughter, that she had a dad who was going to be too much of a pussy to get on a plane and take her to Disney World. And I said, she deserves way better than that. I'm going to get over this fear of flying, even if I'm screaming and crying. Every, everything, you know, every time I go to the, um, to the airport, I don't care. And in fact, I'm going to go get my private pilot's license. I'm going to take lessons. So, so that's what I did. I started taking lessons and it was, uh, it was a hell of an experience, <laughs> but an amazing thing happened afterwards. I started to love flying and I got my private pilot's license, got my instrument rating, got my commercial rating, my seaplane license, and now I compete in aerobatics, you know, flying wow. a stunt plane, doing exactly what would have terrified me even to talk about 15 years ago. So that, Josh, was, was my journey and, you know, obviously shortcut a lot of it, but I went from being the, the, the biggest wimp in the world, afraid of everything, trying to, you know, become this macho, tough guy that everybody liked to all of a sudden Captain Courageous and living this really authentic and meaningful and much more successful life because I found courage. And so I wanted to figure out how that happened. So I started interviewing neuroscientists and, uh, uh, six years of research and 32 neuroscientists later, I said, I got to put this in a book and I got to share this with everybody because people's lives can change if they knew all this information that I just spent six years learning and they wouldn't have to go through a near-death experience to, to uh, understand that. Yeah. And, and also in your book, and just I kind of want to highlight what you were talking about when you were young and you saw this plane crash at Boston, Logan. Now, you, you talk about there's... Um, and forgive me if, if, if I get this wrong, I'm still learning myself, of course, but like you talk about the semantic memory in your book, that the one that remembers all the details, plane crash, yeah. um, lots of fire, lots of this and uh, lots of chaos. And then you talk about the emotional memory that is tied to those events, like terror, like the uh, feeling of being terrified and, you know, the, the fear generated of actually flying. So, but then you talk, you also discuss in the book how we can sort of, um, transform those emotional memories and maybe tie something positive to the semantic memories because you can't change the details of what happened but exactly. you you can exactly. you can kind of change how you feel about it so what was that process uh, like for you because of course you had this emotional uh, turmoil that you were feeling with this memory but how did you kind of sort of um reshape that to allow you to get to that led you to get the courage to actually take on flying and to the point, especially to the extent you are now competing in like aerobatics and everything. You, you know, Josh, this is, uh, this is such fascinating research. And I first started learning about it at, at Harvard with a guy named uh, Scott Orr. Um, and, you know, you're a Marine, so you understand 
the issues with PTSD, post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress syndrome. And, right. uh, and, and one, of the, one of the big research areas is how these memories are stored. And what's fascinating is that semantic memory, just the facts, basically, that's stored in, in one part of your brain and the emotional memory that's tied to it is stored in a different part of the brain. So the emotional memory is actually stored in the limbic system or the amygdala. And so it's, it's in our fear center. And what happens, one of the really interesting research things they found is that when you recall a memory, you basically have 10 minutes, a 10 minute window to change that emotional pairing with it. So if you go to an hour long psych, psychologist session to to talk about you know an, an issue you might have with your parents or with with you know something that happened in the military or whatever it is you really only have 10 minutes to effectively change that association and what happened for me is you can you can make that emotional association even stronger so i saw the plane crash and coincidentally two weeks later my family was going to go on our first plane trip to Georgia, my aunt and uncle had a puppy and we were gonna go get the puppy and, and bring it back. So we, we'd never been anywhere as a family together. So it was our first trip, everyone's all excited. We got to the airport and as soon as I saw the, the logo, a Delta logo on the tail of a, a DC-10, I, I saw, I re-saw that crash because it was a Delta plane that crashed and I flipped out. So I had this immediate amygdala hijacking so my emotional and semantic memories got recalled. It saw death, dismemberment, destruction, and pain associated with that uh, airplane and even more so with that Delta logo. So I flipped out. <laughs> I mean, I literally was kicking and screaming and crying so much so that we got kicked out of Logan Airport. So what that actually did, since my parents didn't make me go on the plane and didn't make me overcome that fear, is it made, it made the emotional association even stronger. So it told my, my subconscious mind, I'm right. That was a really bad place to be. It was a bad situation. I need to get away from there. And I did. So instead of rewriting that emotional memory, I made it stronger. And, and the interesting thing is what happens with a lot of people, and they've, they've talked about this with PTSD, there are two components to our, our brain that are important. One is being able to predict uncertainty, and we can talk about that in, in a little bit more later. But the other is being able to classify emotions associated with an event. So one of the problems that we have, uh, and, and this is especially true if you don't have a really good um, uh, parental understanding of, of emotional intelligence growing up. You know, if you, if you grew up like me in a blue collar uh, kind of Boston Irish Catholic family, then it's just, you know, just, just uh, you're going to cry. We're going to give you a reason to cry, that, that, that type of thing. And there's not a lot of emotional intelligence. But if you start to name emotions, then your body, your brain, your subconscious actually creates a filing system. So you can have the more emotions you become cognizant of and, and the, the more uh, extensive your emotional language is, the more things that, that you can put in specific categories and the more you're able to do what neuroscientists call consolidate a memory. The problem with PTSD, with, with traumatic events that, that some people have, is that you, I get the guy in the background, is <laughs> my uh, gardeners out there doing some, doing some work. Sorry. Uh, so, but the, the problem is when you, uh, when you can't consolidate those memories, they keep recurring and they keep coming back up with that emotion. So being able to classify, this is a great tip for parents. This is super important for parents to be able to, to teach your kids as many emotions as you can and have them classify them as often as, they, as you can. Say, what are you feeling? Now, you, I, I don't believe in this touchy-feely bullshit that you, know, you should feel emotions all the way through. You should stop what you're doing because that's letting the emotion be in, in control. So rather what I tell my kids to do is, is figure out what emotion you're feeling, understand what that emotion is, and now realize what you have to do from an action perspective. So it's, it's okay to understand and to feel those emotions, acknowledge them, but, but don't become prisoner to them. Don't let them control you because we have the ability in our conscious mind, especially with the courage center, we can 
talk a little bit about Josh, to be able to take strategic action and make long-term planning. And that's when, when, when I get really, you know, frustrated with people who say, no, I want to feel the emotion. I want to go through the process. And the truth of the matter is you, you can either let emotions control you or you can control and understand the emotions. And that's a much healthier and much more courageous way to behave. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a really good point because um, it's not that, you know, feeling those emotions is necessarily a, a wrong thing. Like you mentioned, I mean, we're human. I mean, we're naturally going to feel anger, frustration, you know, stress and, and the works, but just, you know, kind of understanding those and shifting them because I, I, like, I, I don't want to feel stressed. I don't want to feel unhappy or, or sad. And I don't want to like, remain that way uh just for the sake of feeling that emotion it's like i don't, I don't like feeling <laughs> that way so um and this yeah. even happened a couple of times um you know before we hit record here i was um you know doing my archaeological project in the virgin islands and i will admit there was a couple of moments where i got pretty stressed during like the time i was working there It was a stressful project but i tried to shift my mindset and thinking because if, if I just remain stressed, I, I'm not going to be happy being there. I'm not going to be happy doing my job. And so I tried to find uh, something good about it. It's like, yeah, this is hard work, but I'm outside. It's a beautiful day. I'm by the beach. And, um, you know, I, I just, <laughs> I just, say, just Josh, a lot of my buddies in Boston listening to this podcast aren't going to give you a whole lot of sympathy for your, <laughs> your tough job at the Virgin Islands. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so ult ultimately it's just, um, I was trying to find, um, a good situation out of what it was that, that, that I was feeling. I'm sure there's probably a much better way I could, I could phrase that, but I'm hoping I'm falling, at least falling in line with what it is you're talking about here. Well, what I'm really talking about, Josh, is what neuroscientists call agency. And, mm. and this is what I spent so much of 2020 working with uh, corporations and, and associations and people on because there was, so our brain, as you know, is a prediction engine. We mm. try and figure out the outcome of every event. When we can't predict the outcome, that creates uncertainty and we feel disempowered. So we start to feel like we're losing control of, of our life. And in, you know, when we have a fear response, here, here's a, a good fact for your listeners. When a mouse gets scared, its, it's fear reaction is to freeze. When a leopard gets scared, its fear reaction is swift and incredibly effective action. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I split everybody that I talked to up in into uh, either one group or the other during 2020. So people are either a mouse and they're sitting there waiting for COVID to end, waiting for the elections to be over, waiting for this. They're, they have they feel this uncertainty. They feel disempowered and they they freeze. They're the mouse that sits there waiting for things to get over. Those are the people who are also saying I'm, I'm depressed. I'm sad. I feel lethargic. And I, it's okay. I'm just going to feel this way. And so they stay. They, they become committed to those feelings and they allow those feelings and, and that disaction to take that inaction that they're feeling to take control of their life. The leopards, on the other hand, are the ones who are going to take action. If I do something, I'm going to get more data to feedback. I'm going to change the way I think. And the agency component of this, Josh, comes in because we can, when we understand the things that we can control, we have so much better feeling in our life in terms of uh, understanding our environment. So you couldn't control the mosquitoes. You couldn't control the the weather, you couldn't control the sun beating down on you, the time of day you had to work, all the, all the things that you couldn't control, but you could control your reaction to all those things. Right. And once you understand that, then you can say, look, yeah, I'm, I'm upset, but I can control these emotions. I can understand that I'm upset and still take action to make my life better. I still know that I can control my diet. I can control my exercise. I can control things that I try and innovate with my business. I can get back in shape. I don't have to you know, sit around drinking beer, binging on Netflix every night. So when you have that agency and you understand what you can control, then your life and your outlook on life becomes much more proactive instead of being reactive and waiting for, waiting for everything to change. So that's, that's a, a big difference that I saw in, in people in 2020. And, and even now we're almost a full quarter into 2021. You know, I, 
I still see some people I I call bullshit on a on a CEO I work with uh, two nights ago because he's he's got a uh, uh, he's getting transferred to a new to to run all of a um, uh, North Africa uh, sorry Europe and uh, uh, Africa EMEA for uh, uh, his company and so wow. he's saying well you know I'm gonna wait till we move I'm gonna wait till the the we get our vaccine I'm gonna wait till our visas are approved and everything else and I said that, you know that's bullshit start start taking action now and and get off of this you know sort of frozen in time because your competitors are either moving or if they aren't moving then you've got a great opportunity to get in advance of them and that's one of the best things that we can get out of this this time of adversity we can turn into an advantage yeah absolutely well i i want to expand on something uh, really quick you know you brought up uh, the example of yes you can't control what's happening around you around you but you can also can, can control um how you react to it and then with the midst of the pandemic um, I think one thing that I personally take into consideration is uh, being physically and mentally uh, prepared for that event. Like when I knew that there was this new virus that was spreading across the globe, like right away, my reaction was, right, well, I better, you know, buckle down on the training. I better buckle down on the diet and nutrition, you know, and make sure my health is in order because, and I don't want to sound like a pessimist, but it's uh, th the way I was seeing how fast this virus was spreading. I kind of felt like to me, it wasn't a matter of if I get the infected with the virus, it was just a matter of when. And so I was pretty much preparing for a fight that I knew was coming. So I really buckled down on the um, the physical training and the diet, the nutrition, the sleep, you know, all that stuff. So kind of framing that into a question is just, is there a way for us to mitigate fear? And maybe mitigate's not the right word, but just through physical and maybe mental and perhaps I'll even throw even spiritual preparations into the mix yeah. too. Is Are those good ways to mitigate fear? And how has that kind of sort of played a factor into your own life when you yourself had to kind of come over your own fears? Well, Josh, I, I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I wouldn't use the word mitigate because I, I don't want to mitigate fear. I want to, I want to cultivate courage mm -hmm. and courage to me is acting rationally in the face of fear. And one of the things that I, I talk about in the book, I give the example of uh, some of the Stoics and uh, especially Cato, who was a, a senator, Cato the Younger, there was a, his dad had the same name. But um, one of the things he used to do is it, the senators back in the, the days of um, the Roman Empire would go through town and they had really ornate sandals and they had the nicest togas and they, they were set apart from everybody. And Cato would go into town looking like a peasant. He'd, he'd go barefooted, he'd wear a, a really cheap toga, you know, the equivalent of, of uh, Walmart clothes or something like that today. And, uh, and the reason he did it is he wanted to feel what it would be like if he lost everything. And so Stoics call this a premeditation of evil. He took it one step further. He didn't even premeditate it. He acted it out. But uh, one of the things that was really interesting, I think a lot of people have been surprised by, is I talk about what happened in my um, mental training at the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. And we started out, and the doctor's name is Shane Murphy. And like I said, Shane's one of the guys we interview at the end of chapter six, I think it is, in, in the audio version of Fear is Fuel, and it's a great interview. He's, he's a terrific guy. Uh, and he was the head psychologist there, sports psychologist for 15 years. So Shane started out teaching me how to get in this hypnotic state, basically, how to get prepared for visualization. And, and it was relaxing my body, so I felt like I was floating above myself. And then I pretend I was seeing this giant uh, IMAX screen, like a you know complete 3D vision of the race course. And it was awesome. The first few days, it, it, you know, we had the noise. I was in this egg-shaped thing with 10 speakers around you and Shane's voice and water noises and all this stuff to make it as realistic as possible. And you could, you could really create this memory of a race. And, and your mind doesn't know the difference between visualization and real events. Now, uh, visualization tends to have a little less uh, emotional impact, so the memory isn't as strong, but literally we don't know the difference, and the same holds true for, for dreams as well. All this information gets stored in our subconscious mind. But what happened after the first week or so, I'm digging this, you know, we were doing this every afternoon at two o'clock, and, and I'd go into Shane's, we'd sit in this egg, and 
I'd have this great vision of me winning a race. And, and then one day we're, we're in there, I think it was probably the fifth or sixth day of visualization and he's tracking all the stuff and I'm going along, I'm in first place. The German is a half a length behind the Russian guys, two lengths back. And, and all of a sudden my oar hits a buoy and it falls, it flies out of my hand and I'm struggling to keep the boat and all these other boats are going by me. All the other races are going by me. And I'm thinking to myself, Shane, what the fuck? I'm supposed to be winning these races. And, uh, and so I was really surprised and, and I can't remember if I actually, you know, came out of it the, the first time, but, um, but I said, what was that all about? And he said, now we're getting to the, to the real stuff. He said, you've got to visualize the worst thing that could possibly happen You've got to start to understand that if someone in the heat before you breaks the world record, then you got to step up and you're racing, you're racing against someone for a world record. You're racing for, you know, uh, someone who, who didn't have to do the two heats that you took to qualify for the finals, whatever it was. So we started to come up with these terrible scenarios. And actually, I was in a World Cup race in Lucerne, Switzerland. It was a semifinal. And a uh, coach's launch, one of the officials went by going back to the start for the, the next race, whatever it was, and, and uh, threw a wake on my boat, washed me over, bobbled me around, and I actually laughed, right? So, so I sat there smiling, thinking, God, this is like a scenario that Shane created for me. And, and it, had, it had like zero stress on me during the race. And, and it was all because it was in what neuroscientists call my prior beliefs. So by visualization, I put it in my subconscious memory bank as something that could possibly happen to me. And when it did, I'd know my reaction to it. So when we get into trouble is when we don't have things in our prior beliefs or in our subconscious mind or our past experiences, either imagined or real, that, that could possibly happen to us. So just what you're saying, uh, Josh, when you were when you're talking about prepping for COVID, I did exactly the same thing. And I did a bunch of webinars with um, uh, I brought immunologists on board. I brought, uh, you know, some of the scientists who understand um, uh, pathogens and, and disease transmission. And just just for sort of my listeners and, and that sort of thing. And I started, you know, I immediately changed my vitamin routine. I started doing, making sure my recovery technology, I was doing red light therapy, still am doing red light therapy, doing electromagnetic pulse, going through sauna, you know, five nights a week, all the things that I knew would boost up my immune system. And exactly the same thing you're saying, Josh, is, is I was expecting to get it. And I said, if I get it, I want to have my lungs as strong as possible because this is a pulmonary disease. So I started up in my intervals when I was doing training instead of just doing, you know, long, steady distance. I was doing one minute, one minute on, one minute off, five minutes on, five minutes off, you know, really getting the heart rate, getting the respiration up, doing all the things that I could control. Right. I couldn't necessarily control if I end up getting it, at, you know, when I go into Whole Foods. But I could control the fact that uh, I'm going to be healthy for it. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to do I'm going to put to use all the science and data that I have in front of me. And then the rest I can't control. So I'm not going to worry about it. You know, it, it's an interesting point when you talk about preparing for worst case scenario and, you know, more or less expecting worst case scenario to happen. Not that you want it to happen. Like, of course, when you're talking about visualiz uh, visualizing this race, you know, you don't want to like drop your oar and hit a buoy. You don't want any of this stuff to happen, but you're recognizing that it is a very real possibility. And, and it sounds like you and I kind of adopted a similar mindset with COVID. Like neither one of us wanted to get infected with COVID, but, you know, we had to recognize that it was a very real possibility that we would. And so that's kind of where the preparation uh, like came in and clearly served uh, both of us uh, very well. And I've also noticed that kind of in, you know, in this day and age, you know, it's pretty easy for us to retreat to, com uh, to comfortable things. You know, you brought this in the book um, that the, the, the couch is where a lot of people feel safe. So it's, uh, you know, and you brought up the example in the book as well about yeah, how the couch is the new cave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The couch, the couch is the new cave where like if um, our primordial ancestors saw something dangerous in the wild, they run back to the cave. Now we the couch is that that cave uh, for for us. Um, let's see, where was I, I? I was going somewhere with that. With that, um, uh, one one second. Um, darn. 
Uh, I had something well, they, really they, good the, in my head. The just office, saying, Patrick. <laughs> well, I'll give you a second. That I was just going to say the office can also be the new cave for people because when we when when people are getting scared, instead of prepping for the worst case scenario, they're looking for safety. And maybe that may, maybe you're heading down that track a little bit because right. we were, you know you and I were sort of prepping for for the worst case scenario. Yeah, exactly. And so, but when it comes to, um, you know, finding fear and cultivating fear, it's like we kind of have to manufacture our own hardships because, um, you know, in, with now you can go to the couch, you can turn on the AC, you could have ready meal made meals to your door, do, uh, delivered to your door. You don't have to go out and hunt and gather your own food anymore if you don't want to. So we have, if we want to find challenge in our lives to, you know, inoculate ourselves from the stressors that the world is inevitably going to throw at us. We have to like seek them ourselves. And I think that's probably why, and I really wanted to ask uh, Joe DeSena about this, is that maybe why Spartan Race has taken off to the level that it has is because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who want to, you know, seek out discomfort and they need to find some way to do it. And, you know, the Spartan Race is, is a good, certainly a good way to do that, as I've experienced. Well, you know, you know what? I mean, there are there are warriors and there's everybody else. And and warriors are the ones who who run and own the world. And metaphorically speaking, you know, a warrior doesn't have to be someone who does a Spartan race. But I gave people so many uh, tips during this past year in 2020 from a, a covert perspective. Two of the biggest things that that you can do is number one is a cold shower. And number two is intermittent fasting. And you wouldn't believe, Josh, the number of people who say, oh, fuck, there's no way I could do that. And I'm like, are you shitting me? There is nothing difficult, nothing damaging, nothing painful about a cold shower. It's uncomfortable. But standing under cold water for two to five minutes every morning, even at the end of your shower, you can take a hot shower and then go cold for two or five minutes. That does so much for your immune system, for testosterone, for increasing things like glutathione, uh, uh, antioxidant. And it's so easy. Anybody can do that and increase your health. And yet people don't do it because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. that's, that's number one. And, and, and just knowing that intermittent fasting we were designed that intermittent fasting and, and calorie restriction is literally the only thing that's well proven in longevity. So if you want to live longer and healthier, limit your calories. That's that is the, the hardest proven science when it comes to longevity. People are talking about uh, NMN or um, uh, res resveratrol or all these other things, which are great. And there's some science behind it, but there's huge evidence behind restricting calories and, and doing intermittent fasting. So once a week, I'll go 24 hours, and usually once a month or once every six weeks, I'll go three days without eating. And going 24 hours without eating, you barely notice. You might have you know a little bit of hunger, but have some green tea and everything else. And it's super, super strong for your immune system, especially a three-day fast, because your body starts to cull away all the weak white blood cells in your immune system because it thinks it's getting ready to fight. So it makes you even stronger. So those two simple things, people are just like, oh, no way, man, I can't do it. And I could, I'm, I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You can do those simple, easy things, be that much stronger and that much healthier. Now, the, the sect of people who do those things, who work out every morning at 4 a.m. or who even put in a hard day at the office or at their home working and then jump on the bike and do a Zwift for you know a, a training session for an hour and a half, those are the type of people who are, you know, thriving and, and have an advantage in this adversity and who are understanding that being in isolation doesn't mean they have to be depressed, doesn't mean they have to sit around and drink and, and binge watch TV and, and not take care of themselves. So I, I think, you know, so many people need to realize that you're going to have bad things happening, you're going to have good things happening. I mean, for me, Josh, 2020, 2020 was the biggest year probably in my life of ups and downs so i spent six years writing the book after i released it it hit number five on the wall street journal bestseller list nice. i had all these gigs booked at at you know from at, at twenty five thousand dollars speaking fee i had about 20 gigs booked so i'm looking at a half million dollars for these speaking gigs going to great places seeing amazing people every one of them canceled my wife had a bunch of issues personally to deal with, so we decided to separate after 20 years. I got stuck away from my kids for three months because they were in France and, and I was over in Boston and get back in the country. 
to, to get to them. So I had like this amazing start to the year and then this incredible low and, and you know, as low and as painful and, and as much sadness as I've ever had in my life uh, with a marriage that was ending. And then, you know, to go back up and put all my energy into making this amazing audio book that just released and you know, it was getting all these great reviews and everything else but the the thing that i'm most happy about is that that none of it sort of uh none of it sent me too far in one direction right i was prepared for those things i had some great friends who who i could rely on who made me stronger as well and and you know it made the most of 2020 and now we're in 2021 and it's off to a great year and and you know i think this probably going to be one of my best years ever. I've got two books in the works and, you know, a bunch of other fun stuff going. So I think, you know, all of that comes back to that resiliency and that grit that we can either decide and have, have that challenge mindset, or we can, we can have a threat mindset and be afraid of everything and, and cower back and try and numb out those fears. And that's, that's where I used to be, you know, just 15 years ago. Right. Well, I want to expand on something that you just mentioned. You kind of mentioned that like, you know, for a time, you know, you were, you were stuck in, in one place, you know, and you couldn't see your children for, um, you know, three months at a time. And, you know, with social isolation that many people were experiencing during the pandemic, uh, I, I th definitely think that that was another fear that many people have experienced because, you know, you and I, the last time we talked about was that many fears go towards uh the relations with the tribe, whether it's, uh, you know, how, how like, you know, we're perceived by the tribe, whether or not the, um, our tribe accepts us or validates, you know, our decisions or what it is that we want to pursue. But in this case, every, everyone's separated from their tribe a, a lot of yeah. times. So could you maybe kind of take us through um, maybe like uh, some of the fear of just tribal separation, I guess, in, in this, in this case, you know, what, what are some of the things that maybe you've might've uh, witnessed, um, you know, as we were going through 2020? Well, you know, that's a, it's a great question, Josh, because we have three types of fears. As I talk about, we have physical fears, which are, you know, pretty obvious. We have emotional fears, which, uh, you know, a lot of people see and, and feel, but we also have these instinctual fears and, and, every fear is sort of a blend. I talk about it as a terror triangle. So you've got physical, emotional, and instinctual. And every fear is, is somewhere, you know, towards those three axes. And, and the, the tribal ones are, they start out mostly, you know, they start out very much instinctual because we're born um, with, with DNA and with wiring such that we're going to, there's going to be a certain group of people we'll mate with. There's going to be a certain group of people we'll, we'll fight against. And there's going to be a certain group of people that will either decide to co-op or not co-op. This is, this is great advice, by the way, for kids. And one of the best bits of advice I gave my kids uh, before they got into middle school was half the people you meet are going to like you and half the people won't. It's just the way we're wide. It's the, the neurology and the biology of reproduction. So we don't have, uh, we don't have a lot of inbreeding. So that's just a, a natural biological fact that I wish I had known because I, I spent so much energy as a kid trying to get everybody to like me. And I, yeah, I took it so here. personally <laughs> when someone didn't like me. Yeah. So, so that's great advice to teach your kids. I wish I had known that. It also helps you understand that we tend to go gravitate towards our tribe, towards all the things that we know. So we don't pick the color of our skin. We don't pick the language that we speak. We don't pick where we were born or our number of brothers and sisters or what our parents, you know, look like and what a parenting parental relationship is. That's all chosen for us. But that populates those prior beliefs I talk about. That populates your subconscious mind. So that little group of, of people who we become from the day we're born, actually from the third trimester while we're still in the womb, that group becomes our safety net. That becomes where we go to, to feel like we belong to something. And the more social you are and the, the more you interact with that tribe, the more important that tends to become and the, the stronger those connections are built up emotionally with you. Now, as you get older and you start to develop the part of your brain called your prefrontal cortex, as you travel more and you develop curiosity, you, your tribe grows tremendously. 
if you grow up in an area where where you're taught judgment and you aren't allowed to have the uh, to have the emotional curiosity, if you you know grow up where we're uh, not too far from where I was in the back area of of New Hampshire, where people you know never even got out of the state, or or if they did, you know they they made fun of people from Massachusetts, they made fun of people from Vermont, or whatever it was, then then you're going to have a judgment. And anything that's outside of that judgment is going to be something that becomes a threat to you or something that scares you. So those, those either the curiosity opens up your whole tribe to being something that has um, limitless possibilities. And so during COVID, you could, you could spend time you know, online with new people. You could, you could interact through social media. You could start to, to feel like you are still part of the tribe, even though you might be isolated. And, and you oftentimes see this with explorers you know, or, or adventurers, since we're you know, obviously talking about an adventure podcast. When, when I go out, if I do the Iditarod Trail, which is a great race across Alaska, you're alone for some people, you know, 10, 12, 15 days. When you go climb Mount Everest or when you go, uh, you know, cycle the Great Wall of China, or if you do any of these great adventures, oftentimes you're alone. And if you're curious, then you, you're really enjoying being alone and you're not lonely. So you find people with this curious mindset who are open up to, who are open to having their tribe expand are the ones who really did well in isolation. You find people who are judgmental and who ended up having uh, a feeling of, of they, they need to be with their people. And, and you really saw this in, in politics as well. You know, you, you can see the, the different factions bifurcate and not be curious about each other. And it, it's on both sides of the aisle. I don't think any, any side's worse than the other, except they'll each say they are. <laughs> but but it's, it's that judgment. So the key thing for, for people to think about as, you know, in these difficult situations is to replace that judgment with curiosity and try and always think about something that, that you can find interesting or endearing or, or uh, maybe, you know, stimulating about something new. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of the way I have went about, you know, many, many things along the lines. Like, of course, you know, I have my opinions and my own set of beliefs, but I'm curious as to why other people might have theirs in the way. And, and, and you also talk about how sometimes just like the environment, which we kind of started out in might be different. You know, you grew up in a, yeah. you know, an Irish, a Catholic working class family. And so you might your your perceptions and and look, outlook on the world growing up might be entirely different from someone who was like let's say brought up in like rural montana somewhere or something along uh, those lines too but then it's just like if someone has a set of beliefs or circumstances or quite frankly their culture is just might be different than mine this is certainly the mindset i had when i was uh, living in west africa you know i saw a lot of things that you know, quite frankly, were a little bit strange to me. Like I saw mothers like beat their children with sticks. I saw someone like uh, kick a dog out of the way. And of course, immediately based on my culture, I don't like that. You know, I, I grew up in a culture where that's not acceptable. But then once I actually kind of utilize my curiosity, um, I've come to find out that, um, you know, mothers in the Gambia, they provide very good loving care for their for their children. It's just their disciplinary measures are a little bit strict, but it's not to the point where like the child is physically harmed. It's kind of like spankings before spankings became, you know, <laughs> um, kind of yeah. frowned upon. But also then I've come to find that dogs in this part of the world typically aren't domesticated animals and they carry diseases. And so they've uh, probably were trying to get the dog away because they're protecting the family. And of course, again, I didn't, it didn't make me feel good about this situation because I didn't like seeing a dog get kicked. I love dogs, but I understood at least because I was curious enough to try to find out more about that circumstance. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think that's so critical, especially when we get an amygdala hijacking, right? That the, what's going to happen is we have our, that fear center of ours is fully developed at birth. So that's what we default to. We def default to being defensive. And if we can stop that, the easiest way to do that, Josh, like we've talked about is breathing. 
So the, the first way to stop that, that amygdala, which only gives you three commands, fight, flight, or freeze when, you're, when you become scared, it's, it's either that those single level fight, flight, or freeze reactions. When you start to feel that, what happens is that you're just going to do something without thinking about the second or third order consequences. So you've got people who might say, you know, there's, there's someone who's kicking a dog. I'm going to go grab that dog and I'm, I'm going to protect it and I'm going to, you know, tell that guy to go screw. And all of a sudden you're getting bit by a rabid dog, right? And, and that becomes, uh, you, you know, something you hadn't thought out about because you weren't curious in that situation or you didn't ask the person, you didn't stop. And, and this is why, you know, you see people uh, uh, having road rage because they're letting the amygdala take over. They aren't right. thinking, gosh, that, that guy might have his pregnant wife in the car and they may be heading to the emergency room to deliver a baby or or that that uh, woman's dad could be dying right now and she's trying to get to the hospital to say goodbye. And if, if we stop to think about those things, then we'd probably change the reaction that we have because of that curiosity, instead of just being judgmental and saying, oh, that guy's driving like an asshole, you know, and, and think, you never never really think why. So having that having that curiosity and, and opening up your mind is makes such a big difference. And you know, one of the great things, one of the things that's helped me is I could have never imagined, you know, growing up uh, in Boston, if you were a cop, then you know you got it made. You're you're on your way. If you were in the fire department, well, it's it's not too bad. It's not as good as being a cop. Uh, if you're a teacher, you know that's good especially if you're a girl, that's a good thing to do. If you're a priest, oh, you got it made, right? You're all set and you're the, you're the hero of the family. And those are sort of the upper limits that growing up, you know, in the, in the 70s and 80s as an Irish Catholic kid that I said, I could have never imagined, you know, if you, if you looked back on an upbringing like that, I could have never imagined that uh, I'd be living in the French Alps I'd be traveling to Italy for the weekend. I'd have friends from, uh, you know, Siberia and Italy and France and Canada and, you know, however many countries I have friends from. And, and you know, but if you're curious, that can happen to anyone. And you just, you meet people all over the world. And if you appreciate them and try to understand them, it makes you a better person and helps you grow. And And at the end of the day, it's, growth and and fulfillment that we're all looking for yeah uh, absolutely and that's certainly the mindset i'm going to carry with me as i continue on with my adventures and i got some good ones lined up as you and i also kind of talked about before we hit record here but you know okay. actually i kind of want to hear about maybe what you have uh, in in the pipeline i mean it sounds like now you got some good things on the horizon you mentioned you got a couple of books that are um on the lookout for this year that you're working on but like what about just travel um, and adventure you know you're based in uh eastern france uh, right now so just what do you see um on the horizon as far as from an adventuring standpoint well the most exciting thing i can't give away all the details of it but um i've got i've got two incredible uh friends who are both adventurers one is the only canadian to do uh everest without oxygen oh wow um Val saint germain and uh another is a um uh, a uh, British friend of mine who's climbed Everest 14 times. He's climbed it 15 times. He's summited 14. And he's actually in Nepal right now. So uh, his name's Kenton Cool. So Kenton and uh, Laval and I uh, are potentially heading to Pakistan in, uh, along the Karakoram Highway to do something quite interesting in uh, July. But we'll still see. That's still coming together. Um, I think you know, the restrictions around COVID are going to be lifted. We're, well, all three of us are trying now to, um, you know, to, to get in line for vaccines and, and uh, so we, we can travel, but we've got some pretty exciting adventure stuff that uh, we might be filming. And, and that's a, a part of the world you talk about, you know, again, going back to me feeling so blessed about, about these opportunities and people and, and new experiences the Karakoram, if anyone's, if any of your listeners have seen it, the highway just in there leading to, to some of these huge peaks in, in Pakistan, 
is is literally on a cliff edge. It's these things you see on on uh, TikTok or Instagram that you know just make your heartbeat jump out of your chest when you when you see them. So that's like an eight hour journey along that highway, and uh, and the people and and the food and the culture. It's just it looks really incredible. So that could be a very exciting uh, major adventure this summer. A lot of uh, fun, smaller stuff. So uh, mostly centered around rock climbing and a little bit of ski touring, probably doing uh, Chamonix to Zermatt, which is called the Haute Route uh, by skis, which is, you know, basically uh, climbing up on skis and then skiing, skiing down and up and down through the Alps uh, to go from here to Zermatt, Switzerland. And um, uh, a trip to Greece and Italy for some rock climbing is definitely in the works. And then depending on how things work out in the summer, this will be my 10th Leadville 100 uh, mountain bike race, which should have been last year. So I'll, I'll get the big buckle for 10 years of doing it and end up the, the season probably in October at Yosemite and uh, doing some climbing there. So uh, hopefully some, some fun, exciting stuff as well. So lots, lots of stuff on tap for this year, Josh. Yeah, it, it sure sounds like it. And it certainly seems like your style of travel is certainly the the nature, the the adventurous, more adrenaline type activities. But I'm kind of curious, like, do you ever take to, let's say, the cities? Like, would you ever, like, fancy, let's say, uh, a history tour around Rome or maybe, like, yeah. uh, around London? Or do, do cities ever really fall into your style of travel at all? Well, you know, that's one of the great thing about speaking. So I, I go to so many corporations and associations to speak every year um, that I end up getting to some incredible cities. So I'm, uh, uh, I've got something already lined up for London, for uh, Kansas City, uh, for Vegas, which, which isn't, isn't, I'm not a big fan of Vegas, but there's good climbing in Red Rocks, so you can get out there. <laughs> but uh, I definitely, I'm, I'm a uh, big historian buff. And I'm, I also find that, you know, when you're a city like Rome, which is a perfect example, just bringing a pair of running shoes, or even better for me, if you can get a bike, you can see so much and, and get such a good feel for, for being around there. So I think you can have just as big an adventure in cities you know, as you can in, in outdoors, it's just, it's just different, but I love architecture and, uh, you know, I love art. And so there is, I go to Paris, you know, a couple of times a year and it's just amazing going to some of the, uh, museums in, in Paris or Amsterdam, or, you know, they, even there's some great Irish, um, artists. And so, yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of the cities. Okay. Right on. Well, Patrick, we are starting to wind down on time, but before we kind of get to the wrap up, um, I do want to give you a couple of minutes uh, to tell us uh, a little bit more uh, about your book, uh, Fear is Fuel, and the audio uh, book version has uh, just got released uh, this month. Uh, we're looking, we're recording around uh, mid-March right now, so we're just talking about like a little over a week ago that it's uh, yep. been, been out to the yep. world. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the book and, uh, what, and the audio book and what our listeners can expect? You bet, Josh. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, for thinking about the book. It is six years of neuroscience research with three dozen of the world's best neuroscientists. And, and one thing I've found uh, through this journey is experts oftentimes are the worst people to get information from <laughs> if, you, if you want something actionable. Because I'd go, uh, one of my favorite neuroscientists, uh, this guy has been referenced more times than Einstein, and he's in the audiobook, by the way. His name's Carl Friston. He's on the cover of Wired magazine in uh, October of 2019 as well. Brilliant guy and uh, super smart and great perspective on things. I'd literally ask him like one or two questions. He'd talk for 90 minutes. I'd record it. I'd have to go home, listen to it like four or five times just to, just to understand anything. So I've got all these experts and what I did was distill it down into really actionable information. I got rid of all the academic mumbo jumbo and put it into stuff that we can use every day. And, and if we understand how our brain works, then we can tap into our courage center. We can make great decisions in life. And that's what the book's all about. It's all about how we can use fear to act in the face of courage. And like we were talking about before, you have to stress yourself. You have to scare yourself every single day to get used to accessing that courage center. We've got the fear center that we're born with. We've got the courage center that we develop. 
the more we develop it, the greater our life will be. If you want an absolutely amazing life, you've got to learn how to open up that that um, adult supervision, what's called the working memory in our in our brain, and allow it to make great decisions, to be curious and not be closed and judgmental like we talk about. So Fear is Fuel addresses all those things. The audio book that Josh just mentioned is uh, that came out last week is spectacular. It's really fun because we took all of 2020 when I would be out speaking and, and doing appearances and focused on doing an audiobook with 10 great celebrities from uh, Carl Friston, that Nobel Prize, you know, for sure winning uh, um, doctor at University College London to Amelia Earhart, who actually flew solo around the world in a single engine plane to uh, a reclusive billionaire, Texas billionaire, who never gives interviews, gave us an interview and actually told us the best advice he ever gave his own kids. So really cool stuff in the audio book. It's lots of fun. It's read by a former professional baseball player and ESPN commentator named Lou Merloni, who played for the Red Sox for six years. Uh, so we had a lot of fun with the production. Hope you guys will like it. I also uh, have done a series of masterclasses and the most impactful one is the parenting masterclass. So it's using neuroscience to raise great kids. I mentioned that 50% rule. Uh, that's just one of the probably 50 things that we talk about in the 10 part masterclass. So you can find that on pjsweeney.com and uh, you can find the book and the audio book on Amazon and, and Audible and uh, any place, uh, you know, good books are sold. And then I'm always on Instagram, the fear guru. Uh, the website is pjsweeney.com or fearisfuel.com, either one of those. And, um, I guess I think that's about it. Twitter, PJ Sweeney, and uh, LinkedIn, uh, Patrick Sweeney, Fear Guru, uh, Facebook, The Fear Guru. All right. <laughs> so and I think that covers the job. Yeah. And they can also find links to all those in the show notes for this episode. And same thing if they're watching the video version on YouTube, it'll be in the description below so they can find uh, links to all those uh, down there. All right, Patrick. Well, as we uh, get to the wrap up, uh, you know, last time, I had asked you to issue a challenge uh, to our listeners, and I'm going to ask you to do that uh, yet again here, especially now, like you said, we're wrapping up uh, the first quarter of uh, 2021. So we still got, you know, a bit of a year ahead of us. So what I'd like to ask you is what challenge would you issue to our listeners today for them to go out there and start living a more adventurous life? So my challenge, Josh, to everyone today is a little bit different than last time. What I want to do is get the focus off of you and put it on 10 other people. So I want you to find 10 other people and I want you to ask the best thing they did in 2020 and the worst thing that they did. And don't, don't give any commentary. Don't try and finish their sentences. Don't make any judgments. Just sit, be really present and listen. And then what I want you to do is once you've asked 10 people the best thing and the worst thing they did in 2020 is put it together and see if you can find any commonality between sort of the happy people and the adventurous people and the people who grew and the people who maybe didn't have as good a year, maybe are more likely to be complaining, maybe feel like uh, they're depressed or or uh, not in the, the right state that they want to be in mentally or physically or what have you. But look for a pattern, ask 10 different people those things, look for a parent, pattern, and then think about how you feel and what comes up for you after that, because that should give you enough insight on who you know that's happy, who you know that's unhappy, and some of the things that go into that. So I hope that's a, a good challenge. Hit me up on social media and let me know how that goes as well if, uh, uh, if you pick up you know, any interesting uh, observations? You know, I, I think this would actually make a good topic for my solo cast. I have uh, my travel reflection uh, solo show that I do for that. So that might be a good topic uh, to bring up for, for a solo cast. So yeah. All right. Okay. Well, Josh, are you on uh, Clubhouse? I am actually, I'm, I'm not on Clubhouse. And to be honest, I'm not quite entirely sure what that app entails. I haven't dove into it just yet. All right. Well, I am. Uh, I'm happy to send you an invite for it, and okay. uh, it's. I think you know it's it's a standalone app right now, but I see it as more of a feature. So I see it as something that would be great on LinkedIn, um, and or something that that Twitter or Instagram could make. It's it's basically just drop in 
audio only, um, you know, engagement. And, and so you can pick a topic and, and this might be a fun one for you and I to do together, pick a topic, uh, invite people to, to just drop in and share what they want. You, you can choose who speaks, who doesn't speak and that sort of thing. But it's, uh, they, everyone's saying it's the most addictive app uh, so far from a social media. People are literally getting up on it and just leaving it on six or eight hours a day while they kind of go through their day listening to different, you know, everything from uh, cooking shows and, and, you know, what, what wine to, to have with your spaghetti bolognese to, uh, uh, to how to start your own side hustle. So there's all sorts of subjects on it, but uh, I'll send you an invite. It's an invitation only. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I think they're doing a good job of building up a community. So uh, I'll send you an invite, have a listen to Please, us. Yeah. And if you want, let's do something. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. I appreciate that. Right on. All right. So what I have next for you, Patrick, is my final three. Now, you you answered these before, but I'm curious as to whether or not maybe your answers uh, might be different. So and we're going to do this kind of rapid fire. You ready? Okay, and I can't remember. I can't remember my answers last time, Josh. So and and, we'll and yeah, and, 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 and also to be honest, a shortcoming on my part, I didn't even think to go back and check to see what your answers actually were. So, um, well, so I guess uh, here, here we go. We're good, uh, we're all good. <laughs> okay, um, all right. So, so the first of the, your, these questions: What is your favorite place that you've been to so far? Chamonix, France. Okay. All right. And uh, the next question, what is one thing on your bucket list that you have yet to do? Mm, um, climb Vincent Massif in uh, Antarctica. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, Antarctica. I'm, I can't wait to get there uh, myself someday. All in due time. Definitely. Um, I'm trying to make it to all seven continents, like I mentioned. So, all there right. You know. Very cool. All right. And the last question, and this is a two-parter. What is your favorite animal? And have you seen this animal in the wild? Ooh, uh, my favorite animal. That's a tough one. Like two immediately come to mind. Both I've seen. One I actually, actually both I've touched. So I'll I'll cheat and I'll give you two. Uh, one a bald eagle, and uh, I've seen and touched at a, a rookery. So uh, and then two a cheetah, and I've touched one in a recovery, like a rescue place in South Africa. So okay. so yeah, cheetah, cheetah, and uh, bald eagle. Okay, right on, awesome. All right. Well, Patrick, that that's it, man. That's uh, all the questions that I have for you. But before we uh, call it a day here, let's just recap one more time where our listeners can go find you, where they can go uh, pick up a copy of the book or download uh, the audio book. So website, social media, you know, the gamut. What do you got? You got it, Josh. Okay. So the book and the audio book available on Amazon, <clears throat> excuse me, the book and the audio book available on Amazon. Audio book is also on audible.com and iTunes. So check that out, Fear is Fuel. And uh, the website is pjsweeney.com. And that's where my blog and speaking and all that information, the master classes are also available on pjsweeney.com. And the other website for the book and the audiobook is fearisfuel.com. Instagram, The Fear Guru. Twitter, at PJ Sweeney. Facebook, The Fear Guru as well. LinkedIn, Patrick Sweeney, Fear Guru. I think that's it. Okay. And like I said, I will get all those linked up in the show notes for this episode. So the listeners can go and find them there. Well, Patrick, I want to thank you very hey, much. Hey, Josh. Yeah. One other thing I got on um, pjsweeney.com is a fear test which is kind of fun. So your listeners might enjoy that as well. It takes about six minutes and it tests your level of fear and courage in nine different categories. So if you go to uh, pjsweeney.com forward slash fear test, uh, I think that's the URL for it, or you just go on the homepage and click fear test. It's a pretty fun uh, little test and gives you some insight into yourself. All right. Sounds good. And I'll also get that linked up uh, in the show notes uh, as well. So they can find that quick and easy uh, for sure. All right. Well, pa well, Patrick, I want to thank you very much for taking the time for, for joining me today. Um, again, I was 
hoping we could have done this in person, but you know, I mean, next best thing is uh, the digital version. And I also want to thank you for your patience. I know we kind of had to go back and forth a little bit to get this set up and we got the time difference and uh, the internet wasn't really cooperating for us very well uh, this time around, but I appreciate you being here. I appreciate how you show up in the world and, and I certainly value, um, you know, the connection that you and I have made along the way. So yeah, thanks a lot for joining me for round two and sharing your insight with myself and the listeners. Josh, thanks so much. And, and to all your listeners, thanks for taking time. I know you've got a lot of choices and a lot of busy stuff to do. So I hope uh, Josh and I will be able to bring something that positively affects your life. Uh, Josh, it's great to talk to you as always. Look forward to buying you a beer at the at the Spartan Media Fest, maybe maybe this fall, maybe the end of the summer, something like that. And uh, Or uh, if you get a chance, I'll probably be at the death race in June up in Vermont. Mm-hmm. So maybe you can come up there and enjoy uh, three or four days suffering (laughs) (laughs) all righty sounds great uh thanks thanks again patrick all right you bet thanks josh